nice article in the Managing Madrid uh, blog. The wonderful lads that do a great job there. And worth reading about that man there. So he bet the man needs to rest and the numbers reveal why. Times ended up almost looking like a 6 3 1. Some very good writing about that on the Managing Madrid website. Frustrate podcast as well. Pere Valverde was a huge part of the equation. Hello and welcome to a Monday edition of the Managing Madrid podcast. It is El Dia Después. I'm your host, Kian Sabani. I'm joined by Lucas Navarrete. This is long overdue because Lucas couldn't record last week. He missed the mailbag. And I really was looking forward to that one because you were just coming back from the Ceramica game. You were there at the... Remontada against Villarreal. So uh, I'll touch on that. Maybe maybe we can do that after we talk about yesterday's game. But welcome, man. Happy Monday. How you doing? Thanks, Kian. I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. Last night was uh, a good win for Madrid. I thought maybe the performance was not as convincing as, uh, as we would have liked. But anyway, as we will surely discuss now, I think that three points here in San Mamés is great. And other than that, I'm, I'm doing just fine. It's the first weekend of full winter here in Spain. It's uh, down to three degrees during the night here in Valencia, which is quite low, Celsius. So uh, I, know, I know I can't I should Canada, complain too pretty much. Low, actually. I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know I shouldn't complain too much for for other listeners in the US or even you in Canada and all that. But it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty cold here for Valencia standards, yeah. There's a certain part of the winter cold that I tolerate, and that's generally when there's the right bit of snow on the ground to do fun things like skiing and sledding. Like my kids love sledding. So the fact that we can just get the sled and go to a hill, it's super fun, even for me. But the thing with, uh, I find my experience, because obviously I'm in Spain every month. During the winter, it's more cold than in Canada because the walls are not as insulated and prepared for winter cold. Whereas like here there's insulation, there's uh, heat and all that. I mean, there's heat in Spain, but it's, but generally speaking, I have to go, if I'm staying at like my cousin's house, I'm not going to go crank up their heat and make their power bill expensive. But if I'm at a hotel or an Airbnb, uh, they're they're definitely, their bill is going to be high because I'm going to put it full blast heat that's the one thing about spain is that at least in canada we're kind of prepared when shit goes down we got we got we know how to stay warm yeah yeah you're right you're right the quality of constructions here is is different than than in very cold places and it's it you know you can find some differences from the madrid constructions to here in valencia i mean it's even colder way colder here in valencia the feeling inside the houses because of of what you just mentioned that you know nobody thought about uh, being cold when whenever they they decided to build the houses so you know inside the houses it gets pretty cold without any kind of uh, heat or anything like that yeah do you think people listen to this podcast to hear us talk about insulation and winter heat or they want to talk (laughs) us to talk about real madrid i'm gonna guess the latter so let's transition um i saw you tweeting away as usual last night i think i agreed with everything you said i if there was something i disagreed with i don't remember what it is now but I think we both like Kamavinga. We both like Ceballos. We both like Ancelotti's post-game quotes and his praise for both of those players and some other things. I like the fact when I woke up this morning, I saw a really funny clip, wholesome clip of a fan asking Ancelotti for gum. Did you see that? It's a great yeah, clip. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Just yeah, yeah. Abuelo vibes from Carlo there. It's a, <laughs> it's a great clip. Um, yeah. Where do, you, where do you want to start from yesterday's game? Yeah, I figure we should uh, probably start with Camavinga and Ceballos. No, I uh, I really pro- probably didn't expect them both to to feature in the lineup in such a big game. I thought that you know this is a huge game for Real Madrid in the race for the title, considering that San Mamés is always a very tough uh, stadium to play in as an uh, as a visitor. But they both featured. They both did really well, and uh, you know it's it's just very. Uh, great to see Ancelotti finally trusting these two guys because I think these two can can bring a different uh, level of uh, ball speed and, and you know different uh, style in terms of how Modric and Cross tend to play 
they bring more physicality. They bring more pressure, more pressure towards the other team. They and overall they they pass the ball. I think that the distribution their distribution is pro possibly faster than than Cross and Modric on a regular basis. Cross and Modric usually uh, speed is speed it up when when it matters. But I think that it was great for Ancelotti to trust them both. I'm figuring that we will probably see both uh, Cross and Modric uh, against Atletico de Madrid on Thursday, but that's uh, a different story. But Camavinga and Ceballos, all things considering, in such a tough context, such a tough uh, environment, I thought that they did great and they deserved every praise they got from, from Ancelotti after the game. Yeah, it's, it, fit, it was a professional performance to me. Like, you know, you mentioned yeah. maybe not that impressive and whatever, but yeah, pro professional and, and mature. And the fact that we did it with that midfield three, you know, a little bit younger, and also the fact that we were able to bring on Cruz and Modric when you actually need a bit of control is a, is a great luxury to have. Matt and I spoke about that last night too. This game and the second half against Villarreal felt more like Real Madrid. There was a fight, there was a bark and a bite, and there was also great goals. The Benzema and Cruz goals were Incredible. Like we didn't create that many chances against Athletic. I, I think our XG was actually less than one, but we had that element to us that we had last season. And that was scoring these, these really, really difficult goals and goals that superstars score. The Cruz goal was incredible. The Benzema goal was incredible. And Matt and I were talking about this last night too, that one thing that we haven't gotten yet this year is Vinicius and Benzema getting going, like truly get going. I mean, I, they've done, things here and there, but they haven't been on the level that they have been last season. And I think that's inevitable. And that's a sign of optimism for me. I don't know what you think, but I actually, I mentioned this to Matt last night too, that I think the fact that those two haven't gotten going yet is actually a good sign to me. Cause I feel like it's going to come at some point and hopefully when we need it and it starts, you know, at Anfield in February, but you know, even the, 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 the schedule is ridiculous, Lucas. We got Atletico yeah. coming up in a few days, right? Was it Tuesday yeah. or Wednesday? Thursday. 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 And then Real Sociedad at home on Sunday. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> just two yeah. day, pre pretty much two days after that one, yeah. Yeah. Um, I thought we could take a question that came into Discord before we forget. That's on the topic of our midfield. It came in from Blind Magician. And if you don't know how to get into our Discord, just send us a message and we can send you the link. The link expires once a week. So if you can't find it or if you click on it and it's expired, just let us know. We'll send you the new link. Blind Magician says, hey, guys, so with the Ceballos, the way Ceballos impacted the game, and this actually came in before the athletic game and after the Villarreal game. With the way Ceballos impacted the game, the topic of discussion has been, should we renew him? And as much as I love him and his style of play, I don't see it being beneficial for him staying here since it seems like it doesn't matter who the coach is and he'll never get consistent enough game time, as is the same case with Nacho. What's your take on this? That's the one thing. If we're talking about his own uh, desires and his own uh, ambitions, I possibly agree. I think that he can have a better career, um, definitely more playing time in a mid-table team, I think he can be the star in a team like, I don't know, Sevilla, if Sevilla were performing right. Betis even, I think he can be wonderful at Betis and he has a history there for sure. So if we're talking about his own ambitions and his own uh, career, I tend to agree with, with this question, with the comment, but I think he has a role in Madrid. I think Real Madrid need to figure out what happens with both Kroos and Modric and also Bellingham because those are three huge question marks that could very well be decisive for uh, the, the Ceballos uh, matter, even the Asensio matter. So I don't know. Definitely if, if both Cross and Modric stay and if Real Madrid sign Bellingham, well, we're looking at a, a, a very uh, full depth chart that, you know, it seems quite impossible for me to find minutes for Ceballos considering that he's pretty much not being used this season and at the same time Bellingham isn't here yet so Real Madrid need to figure out what happens with these two guys with the two veterans and, and also Bellingham before making a decision on, <clears throat> on Ceballos I believe I think that if Bellingham isn't signed Ceballos has a role 
as a cross replacement because he's pretty much a perfect replacement for crossing the in the roster or the or just the closest one we have. And uh, I think he he showed it and, and proved it yesterday against against Athletic. But my my answer to the to the question would be what are Real Madrid's plans about cross Modric and Bellingham as well? If all three of them are in the squad next season, I think it'll be better for for Ceballos and Madrid to part ways because I think there's no way you can find minutes for a player like Ceballos. Not for a, I mean, no, not con Ceballos. I think he was great last night. I think he has a role in the in this current squad, this current season. But I just don't think you can find minutes for him if Bellingham signs and then Cross and Modric stay. Bellingham was ridiculous yesterday. By the way, again, an, an unreal performance. I that obviously makes sense to me. For the good of the league, as a fan of La Liga, I would like him to be at a Betis or Sevilla. Mm-hmm. And also for the sake of his own career, that's probably his best move. But I don't know. There's definitely an argument to be made that it's better to be a role player at Real Madrid lifting titles than it is to be the alpha at a team like Betis and, and not do that. It's subjective and it'll be down to his own personal preference, obviously. If if the squad construction is as is as it is now, and by the way, I completely agree with you. I, I think actually the Ceballos renewal discussion has less to do with him and more to do with the the dominoes around him of what's going to happen with Modric, what's going to happen with Cruz, what's going to happen with Bellingham. Those are the three names. And if, but right now you have, there's four, right? Camavinga, Ceba, uh, Camavinga Ceballos, Modric, Cruz. And Valverde even. Valverde, but, that's yeah. five, sorry, five. If yeah. there's five central midfielders next season, whatever the combination is, is that enough playing time for him? You could argue that there's going to be enough playing time. He's play, He'd play the same as he is now, basically, right? Mm, not sure, because you have to assume that Bellingham and Chouameni both would be pretty much undisputed starters and will only rest when injured, suspended, or really tired, you know? I don't think they rotate much to Ameni and Bellingham because we're talking about a, an investment so expensive that, you know, they will not be competing for a spot, really. So uh, I wonder, I wonder. I'm. It's not the same having, you know, Kroos, who will have to rotate, Modric, who will have to rotate, or Bellingham, who is going to be an undisputed starter no matter what. So... Uh, I don't know. I don't know. The, obviously, Valverde is a big luxury and a big uh, joker card you can you can have because he can be deployed on the right wing. And maybe you can argue that he actually should be deployed on the right wing more often than not, especially since Rodrigo hasn't been all that impressive in that spot so far this season. So that's a big uh, luxury you can have. So maybe you can argue that there's five or there's four, considering that Valverde will be used on the right many uh, very often. But I'm not so sure if Real Madrid signed Bellingham. I struggle finding minutes for Ceballos, and I even struggle finding minutes for for Camavinga. Even so, and he will be demanding and rightfully so, more and more minutes. So, to me, it depends a lot on 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 the Bellingham situation, and also obviously also on Cross and Modric. But the Bellingham situation is what uh, makes the Ceballos deal uh, very very tricky for me. Maybe I thought he played more, but he's he's played 328 minutes in La Liga this season, which puts him ahead of the Asensio, Nacho, and obviously Hazard, Mariano pack. He's behind Lunin, who obviously got some playing time when Courtois was injured. Mm-hmm. I feel like that's not enough for a player as good as him. I, think I agree. He definitely would be completely justified to not be happy with that. Yeah, um, but I, and at the same time, he isn't. It seems he isn't, though. He isn't making any fuss about his situation. And every time he steps on the pitch, he's he's fighting for for the ball and for minutes. He doesn't look disappointed or upset with his current role, in my opinion. He's and even when you when he's asked about the situation, he says that hopefully he can fight for for a new contract here. He can fight for more minutes here. So it seems that staying here is a priority for him, even though he's not. He hasn't been having the role he probably expected for the last three, four seasons. So he's great. He's great to have on the, on the roster. I wish, 
Ancelotti could find him more minutes during the next few weeks, if not months, because I think he can. I think he has a role to play in this squad and, and a bigger role than he had last season. Obviously, he was great for some late cameos during the Champions League games last season. He was possibly decisive and great contributing in those games. But I think he has a role on a weekly basis in La Liga. I think he's good enough to take care of most uh, Liga teams, and that's a great luxury to have. Uh, when you have Kroos and Modric needing some rest for, for the Champions League, for the FIFA Club World Cup and all that, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with Ceballos starting against 75% of the opposition in La Liga in terms of playing style and, and all that. He's used to the playing style in Spain, in Spain so I think he's, he's great to have in the, in the squad and I think he has a bigger role to have uh, for the rest of the season than what he's had uh, so far. Well, it's funny because, you know, everything's relative. And this season, although he's only played 300 minutes in La Liga, it's already more than the entirety of last season that he played in La Liga. So the trust is is growing. I also think there's an argument to be made that maybe he'll get even more playing time now because he's... I, I mean, I definitely argue that he's proving himself more than he did at this stage last year. I mean, last, last, yeah. like every, anytime he's put on a Real Madrid shirt in, in years past, I don't think he's ever put in a cameo the way he's been playing the last couple of games. Uh, the, the exception being like those games against Manchester City and Chelsea, like off the bench, were all really good. They were really good minutes in, in those games. So I don't know. Maybe he can actually work his way into trust. But again, even if he's lights out good, uh, it's not dependent on him. It's dependent on what happens with Modric, Cruz, and Bellingham, those three. And and that's kind of what it exactly. comes down to. So we'll see. We'll exactly see because, that, yeah, yeah, he shouldn't be ahead of Kamavinga in the rotation. So just because of development, of development uh, issues and all that. So um, it, it'll be tough. It'll be tough for him to find himself as a fifth or sixth midfielder with a player like Bellingham already in the, in the rotation as well. So... It hurts me to say this, but it, you know, no matter what he does during the rest of the season, Real Madrid's decision about him will depend on on Kroos, Modric, and, and Bellingham, especially the latter, in my opinion. But again, I think he should be trusted more this season, and I think he has a role to play so that Kroos, Modric, Chouameni, and even Valverde aren't fatigued or tired when the when the season is about to end. I think he has a, a perfect role to play against 75% of, of the teams in La Liga. What's like the ideal time? I mean, obviously, you'd, I'd like to find out now, but do you feel like we'll get answers on Modric and Cruz before the summertime, or will we not know until the season's over? If we're talking about us, the journalists, we probably won't know for a fact or for certain until the summertime. Definitely, I think, until the season's over. I'd like to think that Real Madrid know or have some kind of hint or input from both Modric and, and Kroos because, I don't know, they Real Madrid shouldn't be blindsided about their their decision considering that, you know, some other deals need to be figured out and some other roles and issues need to be figured out depending on what you do, on what Modric and Kroos decide to do. So I'd like to, to think that Real Madrid have some kind of input or feedback, but in terms of uh, the general public or their general reporters, their, their, the announcements or the reports won't, won't be made official until, until the very end of the season, I don't think. Yeah, it's... As a, as a pure fan perspective, I would love, and obviously from a squad building perspective, the sooner you know these things, the better you can plan. From a fan perspective also, I, I would like to mentally prepare myself for Modric and Cruz being like, if this is their last year, I want to know now so I can mentally prepare myself. I'm kind of, I'm, I, I'm over these Ramos and Ronaldo like departures when no one, yeah. no one knew was coming like at the end of the year. Like just stop, give us a, uh, so we can have the farewell tour, you know, the tributes and everything in place. I, I'd, I'd like to know in advance, as a as a fan speaking, I'd like to mentally prepare myself. If this is the last last dance for Cruz and Modric. I'd like to, but yeah. I did say at the beginning of the season, 
that Kroos and Modric are going to appear in my writing much more this season than ever because this is kind of my way of giving them a tribute just in case. I, I, I hadn't mentally prepared myself for worst case scenario, but I, I'd like to know for sure. It'd be nice. Um, yeah, and if I'm Real Madrid and quote unquote put, put in some pressure on them to, to, tell, to let me know as soon as possible what their future looks like, I think. But yeah. it's obviously their decision. And I get that they need some time to figure things out and to see how their their body responds to such a long season, how even Real Madrid respond to such a long season as a squad. I get it. But on the other hand, they need to understand that, you know, Real Madrid are doing things behind the scenes with Bellingham. There's a future of other players like Ceballos on the line here. So I figure that they need to understand this matter as well. So they shouldn't wait until the very end of the season to let Real Madrid know about uh, about their decision, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, I'd like to ask you a couple of quick questions before we go. Just by all reports, by, by reliable people, there's two right backs on the move right now. Two that we have been linked with actually in the last... Month, although no, not not necessarily the second one, but the first one is Ivan Fresneda, who obviously kind of went on the radar after his performance against us uh, mm-hmm. last month, I think it was, mm-hmm. and it looks like he's agreed terms to both Arsenal on, and Dortmund, but they're just trying to figure out which which deal was better between those two. Which I'm, by the way, I'm kind of curious to see how he does in, in two teams who will maybe allow him to be more offensive minded. Because for everything we've seen from him by Italy, it's more on the defensive side. He hasn't ventured in the final third much. And that's why I was skeptical when he was linked with Real Madrid, whether he'd be a good signing, because everyone saw his defense against Vinicius. But we don't really know. There's no sample size really of him in the final third to know how he is offensively. So I'm curious to see how that looks. The other one is Chelsea going in for Malo Gusto, it seems. I think it's safe to say that Chelsea is going for everyone, but the Malagusto <laughs> thing seems to be real. Two, two right backs who seem like layups to me. They're not that expensive, relatively speaking. Someone asked me this on the mailbag, which I published on Friday for patrons. And I, my conclusion is, I just want to get your thoughts on it as someone who has mm-hmm. sources in the club as well. They want to get rid of one of Carvajal or Vasquez before they commit to a right back. Would you think that that's an accurate accurate assessment that they those two guys are under contract? They don't want to have those two and get another right back. What do you think? I I'm not sure. I haven't asked about this um, a specific matter. It makes sense now that you mention it because obviously those are two right backs. You know, and three right backs on the same squad are too many, way too many. So uh, it makes sense, but it will be extremely hard to get rid of those of either one of those two when they're That's under the contract. They're such legends in the club. You know, it will not be easy at all to find a, a new destination, a new club for them too. So. If this is something that Real Madrid are really considering, then it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough because, you know, I don't see Lucas Vázquez or Carvajal anywhere else than than in Madrid, to be honest, until they retire or, or they re- decide to go to, you know, a, a different kind of club or different kind of challenge in a smaller league, a smaller competition, a smaller country. So... If this is something that Real Madrid are, are worried about, it's it's going to be tough to find Carvajal and Vázquez a new a new club. And you know, I I'd rather have them and sign a quality right back and see what happens. I get that those would be too many, but it, I I just don't I just don't see it. I just don't predict Real Madrid getting rid of, any, of either one of those two just because of the of the facts I just mentioned. So. I think that Real Madrid ultimately will have to address the situation and, and sign someone for, for that spot. Malo Gusto and and who's the other guy you mentioned? Fresneda. Ah, yeah, Ivan Fresneda. Yeah, and Ivan Fresneda would make sense. I, w- I wonder why a player like Juan Foyth isn't even considered. His release clause with Villarreal is 50 million. 
probably too expensive to be of a reach for him, considering that Villarreal will not negotiate either. So maybe a bit too expensive, but you were not worried about that price tag with players like, I don't know, other unproven players, if you will, like Jovic, even Militao. Obviously, Militao was a home run in this regard, but you know what I'm saying. You know, Juan Foyt is, is young. His quality for Villarreal, it's a bit too fragile, maybe, for my taste. He's a bit injury-prone. But for 50 million, I'm surprised that he isn't even being considered. I, I, I think he's more of a certainty that both Fresneda and, and Mal Gusto, who are a bit more raw, maybe, and a bit more green in terms of, a bit more unpolished in terms of their talent and potential. So I think Real Madrid need to address, just as a, so to sum it up, I think Real Madrid need to address the situation no matter what. And if they truly want to get rid of either one of Carvajal or, or Lucas Vazquez before committing to signing a new right back, they will be in trouble because I don't see Lucas Vazquez or, or, or Carvajal getting much interest from other clubs in, in Europe. The problem is that if if you're banking on getting rid of one of those contracts, which you probably can't based on what you said, Lucas Vasquez's contract runs out until 20, doesn't run out until 2024, and Carvajal's 2025. Yes, and sir. if if the idea here is that you can't sign someone until 2024, and that is assuming you don't even renew Vasquez, who is one of those players who, who will just sign up for any role. Yeah, sure. I'll renew. Yeah. Uh, you want me to be the, the water boy for two years? I'll do it. Yeah. Renew me. I, I, I don't, I didn't mean that in a disrespectful way. Vasquez is a really oh. good role player. I just mean that it's actually a compliment to him because it just means that he accepts, yeah. um, accepts the role that Rihanna gives him and doesn't complain about it. And uh, yeah. it is a, uh, it is a, uh, something that I think the club has to look at. And also to figure out because there's also the Vinicius Tobias factor. And my guess is that they don't want to have two right backs plus a developing young right back. And then also on top of that, commit to signing another right back. That's the way I, I, I think the club views it. Time will tell whether that's true or not. And I guess we'll find out this summer if there is any development. But there's no question that if Real Madrid were serious about needing a right back and wanting one, there, there were cheap, relatively cheap options this winter. There, they, yeah. they existed, and they decided. and last summer too. And last yeah. summer, yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. It seems to be not a big priority for the club. I don't agree with this, but the, you know, logic by looking at all things happening and and all the reports being published and all that. <coughs> excuse me, it definitely looks like it's not a priority for Real Madrid. And again, I don't agree with with this reasoning or with this point. Any concluding thoughts for today? No, I'm, I think we did a good episode recapping uh, last night. As you mentioned earlier in the, in the podcast, we are getting into the, a very tough stretch of, of games. Atletico and Madrid on Thursday are going to put up on a, on a big fight at the Bernabeu. Luckily enough, the game is at the Bernabeu and not at the Wanda. Maybe one concluding thought that we didn't address is that I think, obviously, did a bit of this work during the Villarreal game, but lost a bit of that momentum yesterday. I think Madrid desperately need Vinicius to, quote unquote, wake up and uh, and stop complaining about the fouls he received, stop complaining about the treatment he gets from fans. I get it. It's tough. It's crazy that some of the tackles he received yesterday weren't uh, enough for a yellow card while Camavingas was. I was, to me, it's blasphemy. The, the, the referee from, the, the, the decision from the referee in, in those plays is pure and complete blasphemy. But I think Vinicius can do a better job of staying committed, staying focused, staying cold-blooded in these situations so that the situation doesn't get the best of... Uh, of himself as and so that he can contribute uh, in a much efficient in a much more efficient way than he's been doing lately. I think Real Madrid need him, and I think he will figure it out. But hopefully, in time, because these next few games are going to be very demanding for for this squad. 
Well, it's going to be a really fascinating game on Thursday too because Atletico seem to have figured some things out. They look a little bit better. They had a great game yesterday or Saturday. I can't remember if it was yesterday or Saturday. Saturday, I think, yeah. Saturday against Valladolid. lead. Um, new signing Memphis. I don't know what how he's going to do necessarily against at, at Atletico, but it seems to have also lit a fire under Morata, who is looks looks really good uh, on Saturday as well. Maybe he's going to take the competition really seriously. Griezmann's playing out of his mind. They have some things that they're figuring out now. I thought they had a really great performance against Barca, despite losing and were a little bit unlucky. So it's going to be a, it's going to be a fascinating game. Just uh, so people know. This this week, we have two shows exclusively only on Patreon.com slash Managing Madrid that you won't get for free. The Atletico postgame show on Thursday and the mailbag with Lucas uh, either on Thursday and Friday or Friday. Lucas and I will figure that out off air. But those are exclusively on Patreon.com slash Managing Madrid. So if you like the work we do and you want to get in on the action, get some bonus content and join a Real Madrid family, Patreon.com slash Managing Madrid is where you go. Lucas, thanks for your time, my friend. Hey, Kian. Great success. No and we'll yes, chat later this week. Thanks, buddy. You too. Thanks for listening. And before we wrap it up here, we wanted to give a quick shout out to our patrons over on patreon.com slash managing Madrid and specifically to our $10 plus patrons because if you pledge $10 or more per month, you not only get access to everything and not only get guaranteed responses to your questions, you also get a specific shout out at the podcast. So shout out to our $10 plus patrons as follows. Brandon Alvarez, Willie Reed, Will Sousa, Way Pairing, Tobias Royal Bacher, Talab Salhab, Tahmid Kalam, Sushank Damala, Sujai Wani, Sumanchu Singh, Sheikh Khatiri, Shamil, Sergio Arispe, Santos Solorzano, Samuel Justin, Samar Z, Said Mahad, Sai Mohan, Sasi Kumar, Rodrigo Balmaceda, Rishi D, Phoenix, Peter Powell, uh, Paulo Fierro, Patrick Odayafari, Oscar Barrera, Nico Laxo, Nicholas Moeller, Nick Ribeiro, Mowgli, MJ Diego, Michael Zinberg, Marin Myrtle, Matthew Atkins, Martin Ridman, Magnus Lext, Logan Stahl, Leon Savernakis, Kunal Tilakar, Crystal Glass, Kevin Rivera, Jose Cruz, John Fernandez, Jason Fitz, Ian Marley, Graham Gerard, Gary Kohut, Frederick Rantakiro, Frederick Sundros, Faisal Hamdan, S.A. Davisito, Eloy Enriquez, Edward Sossman, Daniel Williams, Khan P., Christian Toff, Krishna Costa, Charles Williams, Brendan Powers, Brandon Stevens, Ashik Bashar, Arnab Mukherjee, Armand Gashi, Armando L, Anirudh Singh, Ananya Kumar, Azaz Hussein, Adrian Rios, Adar Zalukovic, Adam Dorsey, Varun, Fabian Moreno, and Daniel Smith. We love you guys so much. Thank you so much for your support. Thanks for being a part of this family. And Hala Marid.